who would you be trapped on a desert island with? Uh, well, I'd love to be trapped on a desert island with my son, Evan, and I wouldn't like to be trapped on an island with uh, Donald Trump, because he's a douche. Metalcore is easily the most relevant style of metal these days, and one of the bands that put that on the map, especially in Europe, is Bullet For My Valentine. They were one of the very first metalcore bands to sign with a major label, hit the Billboard Top 10, and even go platinum with their debut album, The Poison, in a time where that was almost unthinkable for a band in their genre, especially a European one. And even now, 20 years into their career, they show no signs of slowing down. With almost 5 million monthly listeners on Spotify, they have multiple songs with over 100 million streams, and they seemingly headline half of the big European festivals. And so the question is, how did four guys from a small town in Wales go on to form one of the most popular metalcore bands of the past 20 years? And most importantly, what is their lasting impact? Those are the questions that I will answer in this video. And also, I'd like to thank Factor for sponsoring this video. Eat stress-free this season with Factor's delicious, ready-to-eat meals. They're fresh, never-frozen meals are chef crafted, dietitian approved, and ready to eat in just two minutes. And best of all, they're delivered right to your door. That means you can skip the trips to the grocery store and all the chopping and the prep and the cleanup and all that while still getting the flavor and nutrition that you need. And if you eat out a lot, it's also a great way to save money. It's cheaper than takeout or even worse delivery, which number one is insanely expensive. And number two, the food usually shows up cold and it sucks. And also they have a ton of options. Personally, I like Calorie Smart, which is less than 550 calories per serving, but they also have options like keto, vegan and veggie and more. I love that I don't have to think about what I'm gonna make for lunch. I just go downstairs, I pick something and I know that it's gonna taste good and I'm still gonna hit my macro goals. So if you wanna check out Factor, and honestly, I think you should, head to factor75.com or click the link below and use the code PUNK50 to get 50% off your first Factor box and 20% off your next box. That's code PUNK50 at factor75.com to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next box while your subscription is active. The precursor band to Bullet For My Valentine called Jeff Killed John, very local band name, was formed in 1998 by Matt Tuck and they released a few demos and EPs. And while I'm sure that the guys in the band would agree with me that this stuff is a little bit rough around the edges, you can still hear the foundation of what was to come in the future. After that, they changed their name to Bullet For My Valentine and signed a five album deal with Sony BMG and released two EPs that were much closer to what was to come on their full length album with a lot of those tracks ending up on the album itself. And after that, in October of 2005, they released their first album, The Poison. And if you were around back then, you know that this album was absolutely huge. It essentially catapulted the band to almost mainstream levels of success almost overnight. And one of the most interesting parts of the story to me is exactly how they went from a local band to one of the hottest metal bands on the planet. And the answer to that revolves around their relationship with Trustkill Records. And if you're not familiar, Trustkill was one of the bigger labels in the 90s hardcore scene who put out bands like 18 Visions, Throwdown, Poison the Well, and Disembodied, among many others. And Trustkill had a proven track record of being able to take bands from sort of that DIY hardcore world and getting them to that sort of headbangers ball or Ozfest kind of level. And so they were approached by Sony UK, who had originally signed Bullet For My Valentine, to basically help them build build the band in America, at which point Sony would take over again once Bullet For My Valentine had gotten to that we've got a radio hit kind of level. And so Josh at Trustkill did what he did best, which is marketing. 
he spent a huge amount of money on the band. For example, distributing over 100,000 sampler CDs with other more established Trustkill bands like 18 Visions, paying for the Tears Don't Fall video shoot in some random godforsaken Florida swamp, and ultimately handling the American release of three things by Bullet For My Valentine. First, the Hand of Blood EP in 2005, then the Poison in 2006, and the live Brixton DVD in 2007. And at that point, it was basically mission accomplished, and so Sony took the band over again. And with it being such a huge success, they approached Josh at Trustkill about doing that whole thing again with other bands. Although ultimately, he turned them down because the pieces of the puzzle just didn't quite fit as neatly as they did with Bullet. And musically, most people would accurately describe this as 2000s metalcore, but I think it has a particularly unique flavor to it. If I were to describe it, I would almost say it's like My Chemical Romance and Metallica had a baby, while also sprinkling in some melodic death metal influences on top. And that was a very unique combination at the time, but it worked. Another thing that I think is worth pointing out is how much of an emphasis on riffs and solos they had compared to their peers. At the time, Bullet For My Valentine was considered an emo band by a lot of their peers and the media, probably accurately so because that is sort of where they fit. But the fact that their music was a lot more guitar focused than a lot of other bands in the genre, I think really set them apart because at the time that was very different for the genre. Most of their peers weren't really guitar oriented bands, with of course the notable exception of Avengers sevenfold and maybe to a lesser extent a treyu for the most part their wave of sort of emo-ish metalcore was really more about the cute front man and the vocals were really the centerpiece of the song and so for bullet for my valentine to emphasize guitar as much as they did i think really helped them carve out their own place in the genre and also align them a little bit more with the metal side of things and to ride that wave of success they promoted the album with a relentless schedule of global touring a pivotal moment for them was their performance at kerrang 25, a singular show with the Brixton Academy in London in January of 2006, which was captured on their very first DVD, The Poison, live at Brixton. But still, with all that success, there were questions. Because it's actually pretty uncommon for a band to have so much success so early, and so they were faced with a tall order. Anytime a band has this kind of breakthrough success with their first album, what you oftentimes see is that they're never really able to live up to that again, and they become one of those bands that just sort of peaked early and never really did anything else. A lot of people expected them to be one of those bands, and on top of that, Matt Tuck also had to get surgery because of problems with his voice, to the point where they were almost considering getting a new singer. So the road to kind of getting a voice back was was at least six months. And after that as well, and I had to get a tonsillectomy because I was getting ill all the time. Immune system was ruined. Yeah, and it was just, I was just kind of getting reinfected every two, three weeks to the point where I was kind of bedridden for four or five days. But as most of you know, that obviously wasn't the case because they pushed through all of that. And in 2008, they released their second album, Scream, Aim, Fire. And it's fair to say that for as many questions as people had about them, they managed to keep the momentum going. With the album debuting at number four on Billboard, number five in the UK, and number four in Australia, all three of the singles topping the UK rock chart, and a ton of their songs getting placed in video games. For example, the song Hearts Burst Into Fire got into NHL 2009. All in all, this album was a massive success and answered any of the questions that people may have had about them. And musically, they essentially picked up where they left off off from the poison, but they sort of dialed back the emo side of things and dialed up the thrash side to the point where honestly, I would say it's just like a straight up thrash metal album that happens to be a little bit emo adjacent with a lot of people thinking that this was the best thing they've ever done. But things would take an even more different term on their next album, Fever, which came out in 2010. The 
And this time they went in more of a rock direction. Compared to their previous albums, it was more melodic, it had less screaming, and while fan opinions vary a lot on what the best album is, depending on whether you like the emo or metal or rock stuff, personally, I think it's hard to deny that this is the catchiest stuff they've ever done. And commercially, it was also their most successful album to date, debuting at number three on Billboard, number one on the Billboard Rock Chart, certified gold in the UK. Again, all around a massive success for the band. But even though their first three albums are to this day regarded as classics by their fans, the same thing unfortunately can't be said of their next album, Temper Temper, which came out in 2013. It's by no means unlistenable, but compared to their first three albums, it does feel kind of uninspired and just bland. It seems like they were more or less going for the same kind of thing they did with Fever, but for whatever reason, they just didn't really hit the mark with it. But with that being said, the album certainly does have its moments. For example, Tears Don't Fall Part 2 or the opening track Breaking Point. But things would take a turn in a more positive direction with their next release. In that same year, they released a single called Raising Hell, where they returned to a similar sound as Scream Aim Fire, which was received extremely well by the fans. And after that, in August of 2015, they released what fans consider to be their return to form album, Venom. Musically, it's kind of like a combination of everything they've done in the past, while also being the heaviest thing they've done so far. It also had the more melodic, catchier moments, kind of reminiscent of Fever. Overall, if you like Bullet For My Valentine, you can definitely find something that you like on this album. Have you nothing to say? Can't you see what you're doing? I really think the whole album itself is kind of a callback to the poison. Like I'm pretty sure calling the album Venom, which is sort of a synonym for poison, I don't think that's a coincidence. And on the back of that, a year later, they released a single called Don't Need You, which ended up being one of their biggest songs. And it was also kind of indicative of the direction they would go on their next album, Gravity, which came out in 2018. They essentially ditched their thrash roots and that at the gate style of melodic death metal riffing completely on this one and opted to go for something instead that was kind of reminiscent of new metal. Most critics were not particularly positive about it with the most prominent example being Metal Sucks, which gave it a 0.5 out of five while calling it quote, the bastard hybrid of Linkin Park style radio rock. And once again, fans were also split on this album. Some loved it, some absolutely despised it. Personally, I applaud them for taking the risk and going for it. Did that risk work out? Some would say yes, some would say no, not at all. But either way, I always support an artist who tries something. But despite the mixed reception, after that, they decided to go into uncharted territory once again. In a 2020 interview with Rock Sound, Matt Tuck had this to say about their upcoming album. It couldn't be more of a contrast with Gravity in a ferocious style. It's very technical. I don't know why. You've just got to go with what you want to go with. As a band, as a musician, as a songwriter, you've just got to go with what's floating your boat. And this time around, the heavy stuff is just coming out in masses. The riffs are crushing. There's probably 60% aggressive vocals, 40% clean, which is a ratio we've never really dabbled with before. It's very heavy. It's very technical for the bullet fans out there that kind of like that side of the band. It's very cool and very exciting. And honestly, at this point in their career, they really didn't have anything to prove as a band. They already had these all time classics under their belt, their festival headliners pretty much anytime they want to be. So they sort of had the ability to do something different on every album and they took it. And so with all of that sort of build up and context in November, of 2021, they released what is, as of now, their most recent album, simply called Bullet For My Valentine.
And Matt was not lying. This is definitely the heaviest thing they've ever done with most of the tracks being scream oriented, as he said, and at times having moments that really wouldn't be out of place on a deathcore song. Although that's not to say that the album is all heavy stuff, as it still has their sort of trademark hooks and big catchy choruses. So while I personally wouldn't call this their best album by any means, it definitely stands out in their discography. And again, I love that they tried something different and new. And I certainly recommend that anybody would check it out if you like anything else that they've done. Which brings us to the final question of this video. What is their lasting impact? For one, they're part of this trio of three bands at the time that I think is responsible for getting millions of young people into playing metal guitar. Those bands being Avenged Sevenfold, Trivium, and of course, Bullet For My Valentine. Because all of them sort of came up at the same time and even though they sound pretty different they all had that same common thread of emphasizing these metallic technical riffs with a lot of solos which again wasn't really common at the time but i think their biggest contribution is being sort of the bridge between the world of emo and metal because they appealed to kind of both the my chemical romance crowd as well as the metallica crowd they managed to bring together people from both of those scenes which at the time really didn't cross paths at all on the one hand they got millions millions of emo kids to check out more stuff from the sort of real metal side of things, while also at the same time exposing people from the metal world to now maybe being open to giving stuff like My Chemical Romance a fair shot. And they were by no means the only band to sort of have one foot in both of those worlds, but I do think that they were one of the biggest forces at the time to sort of bridge that gap between metal and emo. And with that being said, I have no idea when they'll decide to hang it up. They've been going for over 20 years now and they seem to do very well for themselves headlining festivals and still drawing huge crowds and with a new album coming probably this year or maybe next year but whatever they do I know one thing is for certain which is that we will look back on them as one of the most definitive bands of their generation all right my friends that does it for this video as always let me know what you think in the comments and also I would like to thank everyone who supports me on patreon especially those of you who support at the true cult level or above patrons get all my videos and podcasts early I do Q&A's sometimes I I do giveaways, there's members only channels on my discord that I'm super active in, and there's even a way to have me review your music. So if any of that sounds cool, hit the link in the description of this video. And with that, I'm going to sign off for now, but I will see you next time.